Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason, and my guest today is also my co-host, Janelle Blue, fellow genealogist. We're both past presidents of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society, which sponsors the show. And Mount Vernon has this year started out with a lot of special interest groups. And Janelle started one on being a book club. And so they meet every month via Zoom to discuss a book of interest to genealogists. So how do you pick the books you're going to read, Janelle? Well, um, I'm happy to be here today, and uh, it's fun to talk about these books because um, all of them have been selected for historical context. As you know, genealogists need to, to learn more about their ancestor, especially when they're writing about it, uh, understanding the time and the place that they lived and what was going on, on. at that time. And so these books aren't necessarily naming their ancestor, unless it's George Washington or John Adams right. and so forth. But, but to know that your ancestor lived in that town in that time, uh, and perhaps at the exact time when George Washington happened to visit, I mean, that's, that's useful information to be able to write about. So, that's the kind of stuff where we do a, ra a large range of books, uh, uh, very diverse topics, um, and um, not so academic that I that everybody loses interest. So we we try to make make them very interesting, and I think you'll see the three that I'm talking about today um, all have a little bit of interest beyond just the academic academic value. So what was the first book that you read? And I'm assuming you're reading a book a month? We're reading a book a month, and the perfect one to start with is David McCullough, um, The Pioneers, The Historic Story of the Settlers Who Brought the American Ideal West. And probably everybody knows David McCullough because he is one of the most compelling historians of our time and such a great storyteller, such a great writer. And of course, he won a Pulitzer Prize for John Adams. You've probably seen the PBS series. I have. In fact, I have it on the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also, um, 1776 is one that I have. I, I, I like to do audiobooks, so I've listened to that several times, and it's so interesting. And so, McCullough has written this book about the Ohio Territory. Now, I'm from Texas, you're from New Jersey. The Ohio Territory is not necessarily the first thing I'm interested in because none of my ancestors went there. But you know what? It's very important. And I didn't realize that, you know, we had the 13 colonies, but the, the Ohio Territory didn't get ceded by the British until 1783. So here was this big, clop of land, 265 square miles of unbroken wilderness. And this, Thomas Jefferson said, one of the most beautiful rivers in the world, the Ohio. Um, and nobody lived there. It was just some traders, um, squatters, trappers, um, you know, a, a few people, hunters. There were some, some remote forts. But there wasn't really any settlement there. They called it the back country or the howling wilderness of the Ohio <laughs> country. And so um, if you want to think about it in a different way that's, uh, that you can relate to a little more, it contains the five states of Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. So that gives you some idea. And I, I did some research one time on a family who lived in um, Bedford, New Hampshire, and that whole family moved to Wisconsin at the time. It, it was before it was a state. And I, I needed this context really to understand what, from what caused them to go there. Um, and it was obvious that in those days, you know, the Eastern Corridor had gotten populated right. and and things were not going too well. Uh, there was a lot of um, financial hardship at that point. 
um, because it was after the revolution and you know the country was in debt. And so the idea of being able to maybe have free land and to go find this beautiful country, you know, was compelling. Right. I often chuckle about how, you know, they moved west because they thought the East Coast was getting too populated. <laughs> and I think about it today and it's like, what would these people say <laughs> if, if they were to come back and see what the East Coast looked like today? <laughs> um, so, McCullough weaves this story around one of the one of the persons who was instrumental in getting this approval um, w from the U.S. government. Um, to and his name was Manasseh Cutler, and he was a, a minister, but he was also a Revolutionary War vet. And he and a bunch of his buds um, would meet at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern in Massachusetts, and they would they would talk about this, that this, this new opportunity was out there. And they had several motives for wanting to promote this. Uh, one was that, um, that the economy was lousy and people wanted new opportunities. Two, a lot of the veterans had had script or some sort of certificates from the government, but they were worthless. Well, we had, we had the military district there in, in Ohio where they were giving away land to people who fought in the revolution, mainly officers. So, Well, that, 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 that's part, that's part, part of, of what, what happened. And he wanted to monetize those. He wanted to create some value for that, for those vets. And so the idea of them giving the certificate plus $20 they could go out and get 640 acres of land in, in the territory. So that's right. what you're talking about. Um, of course, they formed a, an, a, a company, naturally. Right. Uh, and so there was some, there was some reward for the, the guys who were forming this. And, and well, it should be because they were doing all of the, the work. Right. Um, and they were able to um, they were able to get some approval for this, um, and the here were the you know some again the motivations. Also, trade was at a standstill, so they were looking for new opportunities of trade. And having a, uh, the Ohio River was perfect for being able to move goods up and down. So. Cutler also uh, wanted to plant churches. He wanted to make sure that there was some religion that, that, that went out there. And also they, they just needed to govern the, the territory. There were Indians um, out there. There were, the U.S. needed to be able to be in control in some way. And you can't do that unless you have settlers. Right. So that was, those were some of the reasons that they did that. And by the way, there was the Indians in eight, 1785, which is only two years after um, the Ohio Territory was ceded, um, they started oh, conflicts, mm -hmm. and, and that lasted almost 10 years. Um, so there, there was that. What came out of it was the Northwest Ordinance, and that, this is important because it established a government for the Northwest Territory and it also outlined a process for admitting new states to the Union. So this was, this was the kind of the beginning of the growth. And by the way, this doubled the size of the U.S., mm -hmm. um, this one thing. It guaranteed that newly created states would be equal to the original states. And it also forbid outlawed slavery. Cutler didn't want a deal unless that was in there. And he had to work long and hard to get that done. But he was able to do that. Uh, also freedom of religion, other civil liberties were guaranteed. The resident Indians were promised decent treatment um, and education. I'm, I think that was probably a long time in coming, um, or if it, if it did. Um, and so, the author begins the process. He, they, after, after it's settled, after all the agreements are done, he begins to talk about the first settlement. And, and of course, that's 
The, the real story is so interesting because that first group of settlers, including the Cutlers and, and many of those people who, um, who started it, came, you know, there was no treaty with the Indians and there had been conflicts. So there were stories back east about massacres and things. And they just went out there in the wilderness and just started building their little cabins and things. And of course, eventually the Indians were nice in the beginning and then things didn't go well. And then what do you know? But one time the Indians early on, somebody, somebody murdered somebody accidentally or not. Um, you know, there was a conflict. And so the Indians you know, the, the, the wildlife was everywhere. It was all abundant, but the Indians managed to somehow eliminate all of it. They went out and shot everything. Thing. And uh, the crops were, anyway, these people almost starved to death for that one, one season because the Indians retaliated. So it's stories like that and that. But anyway, Marietta, Ohio was the first settlement ever that, that, that started. And, you know, they had Indians, they had sickness, they had weather, uh, crop failures, but eventually more people moved in. And the more that came, they built forts. Um, eventually the U.S. government sent in some military troops, but really they were on their own oh. quite a bit. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. And, and of course, we, we did a couple of shows recently about immigrants coming to the United States and mm -hmm. settling. And, you know, you kind of wonder about these people that wandered out like this. You know, what, what really prompted them to, to go and do this, to leave a safe area and go out into something unknown? Well, I, you and know, I think, I think it was the same thing here. It was different, but it was the same. same. It was the opportunity yeah. um, to be able to spread out, to be able yeah. to perhaps get land that you, you wouldn't yeah. be able to um, in the, on the East Coast, yeah. and just, and, the, just and, the freedoms. And as you said, you know, the, the book may not be or mention your ancestors, but knowing what the times were like. I mean, I've, I read books about coming over from Europe and the conditions on ships and things. And, and I have two great grandparents that came over in the mid 1880s from Glasgow, Scotland. And it's like, why in the world did they get onto these boats yeah. with these kind of conditions? Yeah. What was it really like back in Scotland that caused really the whole family. There was one older brother that stayed, but the rest of the family. So it was, you know, parents and siblings and half siblings. And, and it had to be pretty bad know, to, to have come <laughs> over. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, there are some people who have a sense of adventure. That's true. And, and so there were those, those kind of people as well. Yeah. So what was the next book that you decided to use for the book club? It was called The Graves Are Walking. So I, I told you that we try to do a diverse um, uh, topics. And, and this one is called The Graves Are Walking, uh, The Great Famine and Saga of the Irish People by John Kelly. So if you've got any Irish ancestry, um, this, is, this is a book that's worth reading. Now, everybody's heard of the potato famine. Right. I, I think that's sort of everybody knows about that. but. I mean, actually, there were many potato famines. Um, and the Census of Ireland commissioners in 1851 recorded 24 failures of the potato crop going back to 1728, and that was a varying severity. So then you, you have to ask the question, well, why were they so dependent on potatoes? potatoes. You know, why didn't they learn? But um, yeah. surely there was another crop that could have well, helped cabbage, to feed them. I think, you know, that's why you have coal cannon. You've got cabbage and potatoes together, but it was mostly potatoes. And the thing is, it didn't just, it wasn't just Ireland. In, in the case that this book talks about, which is the area around 1843 to the 50s, um, 
it started actually in Flanders, and then it, you know, the blight went to Holland, Germany, England, finally in Ireland. Well, so why didn't these other countries have that kind of problem? Because they weren't as dependent oh, on yeah. that, um, and they they dealt with it differently. And but Ireland, <laughs> Ireland was so dependent on the potato, and they were. I'll talk about some of the other conditions, but one thing that's that I think is interesting is that between 1843, now this is coming from John Kelly's book, um, between 1843 and 1845, the Irish population of 8.2 million shrank by almost a third. Mm. 1.1 million people starved, starved and 2 million people immigrated. That's a lot of people. Yes, yes. So if you've got Irish ancestry who immigrated about that time, then you, you, you wanna try to find out where they were. I mean, it wasn't everywhere in Ireland, but um, you wanna find out more about that, how, how they lived or if they didn't live through the famine because obviously a whole lot of people didn't. There were several factors for this, for Ireland. One was just bad luck. They just were in, in the loop there with, with the blight. But they also had primitive infrastructure. They hadn't really learned how to, you know, to rotate the crops to be able to ha and diversify what they planted. They just had the same thing over and over. And they also had extreme poverty because the the lower class people had property that was from the landowner elites. Right. And they, depending on what was going on at the time, they had to share some of their rents with the landowner in addition to feed themselves. And, um, and, and so that left them with very little uh, in savings or you know, to be able to put back for other things. And then there was the British, and this, this Irish author, of course, is not very kind to the way the British pol policymakers um, handled this ish issue. Um, it, 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 he says that until about 1900, the greater part of the land in Ireland, 97% in 1870, was owned by men who rented it out to tenant farmers rather than cultivating it themselves. So they didn't, some of them didn't even live in Ireland. But they managed to, you know, they got revenue off of these poor people who were doing nothing but raising potatoes, really. And of course, with, with not rotating the crops, you're, you're you know, just depleting all the nutrients and oh, things yeah. in, in the land. And, and, and eventually, the crops are going to, to fail. And of course, they, they were not, the rentals were not cheap. Right. You know, they, right. They often were taking fifty percent or more of what they were getting out of it. So, you know, that leaves very little to raise a family on if you're working so hard and getting half of or less of what you really were making off the land. And and this <clears throat> when this blight came in. It happened so quickly that a lot of the families, you know, they put the potatoes in in the storage areas that they had. And within a week or two, they were just mush mm. because th that bug had already gotten into, into them. them. And then they had nothing to eat. Now, the British poor laws, and you, you know, everybody talks about going to the poor house. Well, this is sort of stemming back to British poor laws in 1834 centralized the workhouse system to cut the costs of their poor relief. This was the way that they dealt with it. Um, and, and, all, and the elites thought that the Irish were lazy. I mean, that's what the author said. Right. Um, and so they were trying to change behavior, but they, you don't do it by having a workhouse that, you know, there's, there's no way to, to deal with the underlying issues. Um, and so not only did these elites, sometimes they raised the rent even on these poor people, but it, they found it as an opportunity to consolidate the land, and so they would evict them. 
So now they have no food. They now they have no place to live. live. And I guess if there's one caution about this book, it is that this author goes into vivid detail of what happens to some of these people and it's well you can you can the graves are walking gives you a clue about you know how awful how grim this was but it's worth reading because it 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 helps you understand what happened then i mean eventually it got to the point where people wanted to go to the poorhouse because there was a little bit to eat. It right. was that exactly. bad. And they got overcrowded, of course. But eventually they figured out what was going on and, you know, uh, eventually the British did something to help. The other thing was the, the Brits said, okay, we're not going to pay for this. We're not going to pay to help these people. We want the landowners to do it. Sure. Well, they, they took their time, and obviously uh, over a million people died of starvation. So mm. that's the story on that. Um, but it, if, if you've got an ancestor who, has, who, who lived in Ireland during that time, um, it's well worth reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they were lucky. If, if you got that ancestor, y y they were one of the lucky ones because you exist because they, they got out of there. Out of there, yeah. And what was the next book that uh, you moved on to? Well, a little, <laughs> a, a little more uh, adventurous and, and interesting, um, not not quite so grim. Um, and this was a little bit, a little different. But members of my book club were all very interested in this one. Uh, many of us are, are women, so particularly it was interesting. But it was called "Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy: For Four Women Undercover in the Civil War." And uh, Karen Abbott um, writes about strong women who have accomplished something. And so she has written this book, and it's a, and you know, when you think about the Civil War, you know, who thinks about women and what they did? You know, well, they cooked for the troops who were camped in their yard or something. But these were women who were actually committed to whichever side they were on and she's got two on from each side and they were so invested and they were in positions where they could glean information and pass it on and so she goes into a great story about these four people and very briefly I will go through these and the first one was this 17 year old girl who lived in Martinsburg Virginia and remember, Martinsburg, Virginia, later became yeah, West Virginia, Virginia, and the they were sort of not they were not very Confederate. They were more sympathetic for the Union, but this woman was only seventeen years old. And if you know any seventeen-year-olds, and I think about myself. You know, she was full of it. I mean, she was, there was no, nothing could stop her. She, and she was so conceited and she was just a spoiled brat. And it even talks about her riding a horse into the dining room when her parents were entertaining some people. I mean, that gives you a clue about how undisciplined she was. And then when some Union soldiers came in, she actually shot one of them. <laughs> And he died, but somehow she was able to, to get off, because, I guess because she was young. And, and she also knew how to work her feminine wiles, <laughs> and she was flirty, and she was manipulative. Um, she was smart, and she would dupe the northern, northerners into thinking she was sympathetic in the hopes that you know they would give her, and also just to be safe, um, because, you know, you never know who to trust. Exactly. Um, and so she, um, she wound up um, passing on information over and over. She got, she got put into jail. She went to London um, for the Confederacy. You know, they were trying to get acceptance. 
Right. Um, and, and so she went over there. Um, she was in love with Stonewall Jackson. He didn't even know who she was, but she was, she was the typical teenager who was really doing some stupid things. She went on eventually after the war, she went on to write her memoir. Actually, she, um, well, there's a story about that in there. And she eventually became, uh, went on the acting circuit and she would tell her story. And in, in, in that's what, how she made a living in the end. And so a lot of this information is from journals that these women wrote and also correspondence. There's a lot of documentation. Sure. Uh, the next one was Emma Edmonds, Ed Edmondson, who was a Canadian. She, her dad wanted her to marry some guy. She didn't want to. Um, she tried to run away, couldn't. So she dressed up as a boy and she joined the Union forces. And this one probably has less uh, documentation than any of the others. So that that was about her. She she became a, she would send the, the mail back and forth. Um, we're running out of time, but there's other women here. The, the one that's probably one of the most uh, sympathetic is Elizabeth uh, Van Loo, and she was for the Union, but she lived in Richmond, so you can imagine um, what mm -hmm. she was going through. And she, Grant said that she did the best service to the Union, but at the end, um, and he, he hired her, uh, he appointed her postmaster after the war. Um, but then after that, nobody in Richmond would have anything to, to do, do with, with her. her. She couldn't yeah. sell her house. She couldn't do anything. Yeah. So we could talk forever. But we've run out of yeah, time, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, this points out why it is so important to read these different books for the background to, to understand the times where our ancestors were living. And by the way, there's a lot of descriptions about the battles in this mm -hmm. too. So you really do learn stuff beyond yeah. just the interesting yeah. parts about these women. Well, thank you for being with us and bringing us this great information. My pleasure, thank you.